Welcome. Thanks for coming to this discussion of Adam Hania's book. He's um, probably in need of no introduction, but I'll give him a brief one anyway, since he's the star of the show. A reader in development studies here at SOAS, Adam is the author of tens of articles and three monographs, treating issues as diverse as development in Palestine, uh, global migration, neoliberalism, and much more. His first book, Capitalism and Class in the Gulf Arab States, came out in 2011. A quick two years later, his second book, Lineages of Revolt, Issues of Contemporary Capitalism in the Middle East, came out with Haymarket Books. Um, and his latest book, which we're here to celebrate and talk about, Money, Markets, and Monarchies, the Gulf Cooperation Council and the Political Economy of the Contemporary Middle East was published very recently with Cambridge University Press. Um, Adam will be talking for maybe 10 minutes about the book, and then we'll hear commentaries from Sarah Salem here in the middle, an associate professor of sociology at LSE. Her research focuses on post-colonial theory and Marxism, Egypt, the Middle East. Uh, she's also an editor at the journal Historical Materialism. And at the far end, Professor Lale Khalili, Middle East politics member here at SOAS, and her book, Sinews of War and Trade, about maritime transport and infrastructure, will be out this autumn with Verso. So we will um, look forward to a book launch of that in the coming months. I'll hand it over to Adam, and then you each have about 10 minutes for your commentary. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for uh, being here tonight, and especially uh, Lale, Sara, and Lori for helping, um, for being part of the event, and also LMEI, uh, uh, and Hassan and the team for um, pulling the uh, event tonight together. I, as Lori said, I wanted to spend a few minutes just introducing some of the themes of the book uh, and some of the motivations behind, behind writing it. Um, because I think uh, it's very clear if we see, if we look at the newspaper, we follow the events in the Middle East, it's very clear that the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council states have begun to play or have, have taken a much more uh, present uh, role in, uh, in the region um, over the last few, few years. I, I've long felt that the GCC states, however, uh, quite poorly understood um, in much of the mainstream media uh, coverage of the region and much of the political debate around the Middle East. Often the Gulf is just reduced simply to its oil exports or to the, the intrigues of uh, ruling families um, or the role of religion. So uh, what I wanted to do uh, tonight is, is uh, in the book, is actually to look more closely at the, the importance of a political economy perspective um, to the role of the Gulf, um, with a focus on the way that the Gulf's position as a critical site of capitalism in the Middle East is shifting patterns of accumulation uh, throughout the wider region, and that that helps us understand something about uh, the region's contemporary politics. So I, what, I, what I'm going to do in these brief comments is just lay out some of the, some of the um, both the theoretical um, background to this and then some of the concrete examples um, uh, of what I mean. So theoretically, the book is situated in debates over how to understand the relationship between global processes and the ways that class and state formation play out across the national, regional, regional and other spatial scales. Many scholars have critiqued uh, a tendency in much of the political economy literature, I'm not speaking here specifically about the Middle East, but more broadly, uh, for taking for granted the national or nation state as the nation, natural geographical unit and vantage point um, of analysis. I take on board these critiques in the book, and in contrast, what I try to do is to move beyond such methodological nationalism to see how different spatial scales, in particular the regional scale, uh, are produced through cross-border processes. So there are two angles uh, that I approach this from. First, I ask, what is it that we can learn about the global from the vantage point of the Gulf? Uh, if we look at uh, the way that 
the global political economy is often discussed. Uh, the Gulf region is often completely left out in a lot of the um, a lot of the critical literature on on, on the global. Uh, indeed, if we look at the term BRICS, for example, um, which is you know come under a bit more uh, uh, dispute, if you like, in, in recent years. But nonetheless, the term BRICS um, terminolog terminologically excludes the Gulf, um, even though there are, I think, some very similar um, characteristics or, 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 or comparisons we could draw. Uh, the Gulf is often reduced, when it is mentioned in the um, critical political economy literature, is reduced simply to its role as an oil or hydrocarbon exporter. Um, so what I was trying to do uh, 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 in the book is to say, ask, what is it, uh, or what, what can we learn about the global from the vantage point of the Gulf? And to that end, I argue that the flows of Gulf financial surpluses are an essential component to understanding the contemporary uh, world market. That is, a world market that is marked by persistent levels of overaccumulation, continued predominance of the United States and Europe as core zones of global power, but the emergence of new centers of accumulation and political rivalries emanating from China, East Asia, and elsewhere. So, what can we learn about the global from the Gulf um, in this context? This is not simply a matter of adding uh, yet another case study to our understanding of global processes. It's about seeing the global in and through its relation to the Gulf. By better understanding this relation, including most centrally what this means for the Gulf's wider regional neighborhood, I think we can gain some new insights into the nature of global capitalism itself. So that's the first kind of spatial um, angle that I, that I look at, this global gulf um, uh, perspective. Second, alongside this, I also try to integrate the Middle East as a whole into this analysis, arguing that the gulf's location within the global has been articulated through shifting patterns of accumulation in the wider region. And I investigate this through a detailed mapping of major economic activities in the Middle East, including agriculture and agribusiness, uh, real estate development, urban infrastructure such as power, water, transport and telecommunications, as well as banking and finance. And what I argue is that alongside the liberalization uh, of many Arab economies over the past decade, GCC-based firms and capital groups have significantly expanded their involvement in these and many other sectors. This is not simply important in terms of the ownership of capital. It means that Gulf-based uh, uh, investors have become uh, a principal intermediary between the market and wider the wider population of the Middle East. Social and economic policies, not to mention political alliances, are deeply shaped by the dynamics of capitalism in the Gulf. Now, I don't have time to go into too much empirical uh, detail here, but I just want to give a few examples um, of, what I'm, uh, of what I mean here. So to take first the sector uh, banking uh, and finance. Scholars working on other geographical contexts have utilized the concept of financialization, uh, the idea that financial markets increasingly shape the day-to-day -day lives of individuals, households, and firms across the world. Uh, as with much of the global political economy literature, not much has been done on the Middle East in this respect. It's mostly focused on uh, the US, Europe, uh, Japan, and other uh, larger states to some degree. Um, but what I try to show in the book that this trend of financialization is also observable in many parts of the Middle East. But it is not enough to uh, understand this solely from the prism of the national scale. When we look at, for example, the rapid uh, growth of consumer lending uh, and real estate lending in Jordan over recent years, we need to place the development of Jordan's financial markets in the context of the region, the regional scale. Quite remarkably in this respect, GCC or Gulf-related banks hold more than 80% of all Jordanian banking assets. Financialization, in other words, in Jordan, is not something simply about the increasing weight of financial markets in day-to-day -day life. It's also a spatial process that represents the increasing insertion of GCC capitalism into Jordanian social relations. Similarly, in terms of urban development policies. 
Between 2008 and 2017, nearly 40% of all large-scale real estate projects uh, across Algeria, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Morocco, and Tunisia were owned, developed, or built by uh, a GCC-based company. The key tenets of urban planning across many Arab cities, i.e. things such as the privatization of land and public housing, the lifting of rent caps, the extension of mortgage markets, and the private provision of infrastructure uh, services in cities, are thus closely interlaced with the accumulation of Gulf-based capital. So when Beirut res residents challenge the reversal of long-standing rent control laws, as they did a few years ago, or poor Egyptians protest their eviction from informal housing communities in Cairo, they confront not simply aspects of national urban policy, but also the ways that the priorities of urban development have become increasingly intermeshed with the tempo and dynamics of uh, accumulation in the Gulf. We can also see the significance of the regional scale in relation to agriculture and agribusiness. In Egypt, for example, around half of all the food and agricultural companies listed on the country's stock exchange are either controlled or have significant ownership held by uh, uh, Gulf-based capital, almost half. Similarly, when we look in at agricultural land, uh, uh, the operation of supermarkets and retail outlets in Egypt, storage facilities for grain, uh, 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 refineries for sugar and so forth, the Gulf is play, plays a, a major role in these, all of these aspects of ag agribusiness in, in Egypt. Similar patterns can be seen in Jordan and Lebanon. These, these firms, we think of them often as Egyptian firms or Jordanian firms or Lebanese firms. They produce for their domestic markets, but as well, they produce for exports to the Gulf. And in this sense, the mantra of food security, uh, which is what uh, all Gulf states um, uh, put forward as their, their, their kind of agricultural policy, particularly post-2008, actually represent a reworking of agro-commodity com circuits across the Middle East. Gulf food systems are realigning regional patterns of agricultural trade, the types of agro-commodities uh, agro com produced, and structures of ownership and control. Finally, my favorite example is the question of uh, telecommunications. Um, here there's been a very significant shift uh, across the region in the last decade in line with global trends um, towards the liberalization of, of telecommunications markets opening up to, to foreign uh, 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 providers of telecommunications services. And GCC uh, firms have been major beneficiaries of this. Of the 26 mobile licenses present across the non-GCC Arab world, 14 almost half, sorry, more than half, uh, are either fully or partially owned by GCC firms. And for Iraq, Jordan, Morocco, and Tunisia, GCC-owned telecoms control the largest share of the entire mobile market. Now, uh, you might ask, why do I find this interesting? I think it is important not simply because uh, of who might be profiting from the social calamity of Instagram selfies, uh, but rather these kinds of telecoms are playing a major role in shaping the nature of urban infrastructure. Uh, for example, we can see this in the concept of smart cities. Uh, and of course, state repression and surveillance um, uh, uh, across many urban spaces in, in the Middle East. When Moroccans and Tunisians access the internet, for example, they do so through five subsea cables connected to the internet, global internet backbone. This critical infra infrastructure is predominantly controlled by Gulf, uh, Gulf firms and telecoms. So much of the content of this book um, focuses on these kinds of pan-regional trends. To be clear, I'm not saying that these patterns only involve the Gulf, or that all GCC states act in the same way and that there are no um, tensions between them. Um, I look at these differences and I also compare the Gulf's involvement in the region with US, uh, European, Chinese and other, uh, other capitals and also try to explore what this means for our conception or the traditional conception of uh, uh, the, the Arab, uh, Arab national bourgeoisie. So, the last two chapters of the book comes back, come back to the GCC itself and its political role. 
Uh, first, in Chapter 7, I look at the oil price decline that began in, in, in mid-2014 mid and ask what this might mean for economic and social structures in the Gulf, um, with a particular focus on uh, Mohammed bin Salman and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. And I examine the policy goals um, outlined in, in various vision uh, doc, uh, strategies um, promulgated by all Gulf states in the wake of the oil price decline looking at what they might mean for Gulf uh, citizens, what they might mean for the region's uh, migrant labor workforce, and the fortunes of the large uh, Gulf conglomerates. Um, as part of this analysis, I try to draw out a major point about the nature of crisis, because very often the oil price decline is, is presented as a crisis uh, 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 for the Gulf. But I, I try to show that conjunctures such as these, marked by shrinking oil revenues, budgetary pressures, and severe economic downturn, are being seized by the Gulf monarchies as an opportunity, crisis is opportunity, a chance to rework class and state structures in a manner that deepens and extends pre-existing trajectories. In understanding how this crisis is opportunity actually works and whose interests it ultimately serves, it's necessary to differentiate the social structures and forms of class power in the Gulf. And finally, in the last chapter, I look at um, what this critical assessment of crisis might mean to the numerous uh, political and military conflicts uh, currently racking the Middle East. The chapter looks at the contradictions and tensions um, in this period, which have largely been shaped through the evolution of the Arab uprisings that shook the region so forcefully from 2010 onwards. So I look in this chapter at the contradictions between the different GCC states, specifically, obviously, Qatar and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, as well as the Gulf's engagement um, in the wider region, including the rivalries and shifting alliances uh, between Iran and Israel, um, very, very important, as well as interventions in Syria, Yemen, and other Arab states. So uh, I, I think... I'll finish here, but I just wanted to, to make a point. Perhaps this is something we could further discuss um, in, in discussion. But I think these uh, trends are very important because they say something about where the Middle East uh, might be heading, given the numerous crises that we, we currently see today. If you look at the region's business press, um, you'll be, uh, you can, it often seems to be quite out of kilter with the reality that we see on the ground. Uh, the business press heralding uh, the, the reconstruction boom, uh, um, the enormous uh, profits that are going to be made and expected to be made in the coming period um, as uh, 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 some kind of political settlements occur um, in, in, in Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere. And I think um, it's very important to kind of understand the next few years, um, obviously we can't say where these reconstruction boom or these reconstruction uh, uh, agreements may head, but I think it's very important to see uh, the trajectory of these next few years in, in light of what the way that the regional scale has been produced um, over the last 10 years. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for this invitation and uh, congratulations on publishing this really, really great book. Um, I think it was definitely the most enjoyable political economy book I've read in a very <laughs> long time. Even though there's so many tables and statistics, but still it was, it was um, exceptionally um, engaging and enjoyable. Um, I think I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how um, I think important Adam's work has been generally to the field of Middle East studies, but particularly because of this um, almost missing perspective of political economy. So it, I think this book and his other work are such important contributions because of the lack, I think, of especially empirical analysis and empirical data we have on political economy in the Middle East. I think this is especially the case with the Gulf, which is a region that I think generally it's accepted has come to play a really prominent role in Middle Eastern politics. And yet, um, strangely, there hasn't been a lot of research into what that means, how that's happened, and how it actually plays out um, on the ground. I also wanted to 
thank Adam as well for this this work and his other work because I think it's really played a central role in dislodging um, certain frameworks that have been very dominant in analyzing Middle Eastern politics. And I think primarily the framework of authoritarianism and the transition paradigm, which is essentially um, exceptionalizing Middle Eastern states, especially Gulf states, and seeing them as especially averse to democracy, de democracy um, very slow on this global transition towards liberal democratic states, and often centering things like culture, religion, uh, values, norms, and those types of explanatory variables and understanding that lack of democratization. So I think this work is really important and again, um, driving home this point that the region is obviously complex and that political economy is really central as well to understanding um, the, the state of many of these countries. So I wanted to start by first uh, kind of talking a little bit about the parts of the book that I especially found really interesting and really relevant to sort of my own research on the Middle East, but specifically Egypt. I think what especially struck me reading this book was, again, this attempt to place the Gulf within global political economy and global capitalism. I think it's interesting that there is, like I said, this, this broad understanding that countries like Saudi Arabia or the Emirates have come to play a major role, but not necessarily placing them then on the same scale we might place China, Japan, and these other big political, uh, these other big economic actors. And I think the sort of some of the data that Adam presents is really fascinating in showing that actually many of these small Gulf states are more powerful in terms of their ability to influence um, economic uh, sort of the, uh, the global political economy today. For example, um, the argument that, again, the rise of China or the rise of the East would have been unlikely or impossible, actually, without um, the rise of the Gulf um, happening around the same time. So I think those arguments where we start to see the Gulf as part of a bigger global picture rather than necessarily as separate from it uh, was really interesting to me. I also found um, the attempt to analyze the Gulf outside of this category of oil really, really important. I think it's amazing that there's a book on the Gulf that does not use the concept of the rentier state, uh, which, as some of, many of you will know, is almost impossible to find. Um, and I think while oil is obviously central to many of the economic changes that have happened in the region, I think there has been a, a very strong tendency to, again, exceptionalize it and see it as the only thing that we need to look at in understanding the political economy of, of these states. I think added to that, I was very, again, interested in this concept that Adam puts forward, which is that we need to understand the capitalist classes that exist within these states. Again, not necessarily a common way uh, that scholars have approached the region. I think often with places like Saudi Arabia or the UAE, uh, Qatar, all of these types of states, there is this tendency, like Adam just mentioned, to look at them through this lens of the royal family, the ruling family, these individual elites, uh, almost a very tabloid style kind of um, approach to understanding politics. I think this idea of looking at capitalist classes is a much more comprehensive and interesting and um, much more grounded way of understanding the very complex uh, tensions and negotiations that are happening in many of these states. And just to add to that, it's also quite fascinating that many of these capitalist classes are made up of also individuals that are not part of royal families or ruling families, um, as well as individuals that have connections to global other forms of global capital. And I think this presents us with a very different understanding of these individual capitalist classes that is a much more transnational and grounded account of changes that are happening across the region. So. What I wanted to do today very quickly is talk a little bit about how, um, in particular, the chapter on finance capital I found very interesting in relation to my own work in Egypt, but then uh, present two or three questions that um, I was curious about after reading the book that maybe you could engage with if you, if you want to, no pressure. Um, <laughs> so I think what especially uh, stood out to me in, in relation to other, con uh, other Arab states like Egypt, but also Lebanon, Syria, many, many Arab states and their changing nature and their changing relationship with these Gulf states is the role that finance capital in particular has played in completely restructuring sort of the neoliberal transitions that have happened across many of these countries. And 
I was very shocked and also depressed to find out the extent to which Saudi capital in Egypt, for example, has completely dominated not only most sectors, but also sectors that I think have historically been understood as important to be state-controlled sectors. So the, the work that you've done, for example, on the agricultural sector, the production of food, um, the production of infrastructure, and so on, it's really quite... Um, telling to see how much of those sectors have now completely been dominate are completely dominated by Saudi capital. I also found it really uh, fascinating to think in the case of Egypt how visible this transition has been as well. And I was wondering if that was something um, you could speak about a little bit. So, for example, the visibility of the Gulf capital and things like advertisements in billboards, in real estate development, in the new shopping malls and gated communities that have opened up. And also in things like the emergence after 2013, especially, which I think you do a really uh, good job of also placing as uh, within this legacy of um, Saudi and Emirates uh, intervention into Egypt, the emergence again of specific forms of businessmen or, or business families that are very clearly linked to certain forms of capital. And so I found it really... Uh, Fascinating to see that this political economy transition, which I think often is understood through things like statistics or these, you know, shifts, things happening on the Egyptian stock exchange, is actually, once you start to think about it, a very visible uh, shift that has happened in places like Egypt and is quite readily apparent, I think, to, um, to people that visit or in terms of what's happening to the actual urban and, and rural kind of um, landscape in countries like Egypt. I think a lot of that also has to do with this question of land. And in Egypt, of course, this massive controversy a few years ago, um, is it a few years, over these two, uh, these islands that were basically sold to Saudi Arabia. And this was a very interesting controversy, again, because of this idea of land and its connection to the nation and what it means when, when land is being sold. And yet at that moment, there are also very interesting interventions being made in this, this debate around the fact that actually most, a lot of Egyptian land already was sold right to to Saudi capital or to Gulf capital so what does it mean what was different about these islands versus the way we might understand huge parts of New Cairo or um, 6 of October city that similarly um, we could understand through this lens of land being sold to um, Gulf investors or to basically capital coming from the Gulf um, the other thing that I found really interesting that I wanted to note is this uh, idea of time and temporality. So it's really interesting when you mentioned, for example, that the Gulf states also represent themselves to some extent as a break with their own past. And I think often when we think about Gulf capital, it's something that seems to have happened so quickly. Suddenly in the 1970s or 80s, we see this massive influx. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, this massive influx of Gulf capital into countries like Egypt that, that has literally transformed the region. But I was very interested again in this idea of how the Gulf understands um, this question of time and temporality. Uh, and if you could speak a little bit more about their own understanding of themselves as part of this modernizing force in the Middle East. Uh, I think you touch on it a little bit um, towards the end especially, but I was really sort of fascinated by how they also portray themselves as actors who are trying to lift the other Arab states out of this um, backward space that they're in, and how in, in some ways they're also contributing to the very same um, sort of orientalist discourses that, portray, that are used to portray them. Um, another question I had was to think a little bit about uh, the, uh, bringing together political economy with political sociology. So I think the political economy analysis is really interesting and strong, but I was left wondering in some places about how these Gulf states understand their political and social projects. So in other words, how do they understand the decisions that they're making and how does this fit into a wider project that they may have? So I was really struck, for example, often how when statements are made about new projects, they're quite often linked to things like Arab history, Arab culture, Arab language, Islam, the role of preserving sort of Arab power in the global world. And I was wondering um, in what ways the Gulf capitalist classes see themselves um, as trying to revitalize or put forward some kind of alternative political project that is still very much tied to these social, cultural, and religious values. 
and how this affects the way they relate to other Arab states, um, but also how it affects the way they relate to the rest of the world. So do they see themselves as putting forward um, a project that is more than just clearly linked to political economic control, but also questions of ideology, subjectivity, and so on. Finally, last question, if I have an extra minute. Um, I think the other thing I was really interested in asking you a bit more about was this question of resistance. So you, you talked um, quite a lot about this question, obviously, of migration and the role migrant workers have played in building large parts of these cities in the Gulf states. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on how these Gulf capitalist classes understand the role of migrant workers, but also how they account for or navigate the possibility of resistance that in some ways is always present or is always there, but it seems uh, that they don't necessarily see it as something that needs to be taken into account to any great degree. And linked to that, how, for example, do they factor in think resistance from other types of subaltern groups, so I'm thinking in particular um, feminist groups, or how they responded to events like 2010, 2011. So it's a bit linked to this idea of what, what they see their project as, um, but also how in these um, very intricate political economic decisions or moves or decisions that they uh, decisions that they make how they account for this possibility or impossibility of resistance is it something that is taken into account and to what extent great thank you thank you Sarah um, folks there are a few chairs down here for people who are standing in the aisles if you want to brave coming to the front of the theater there are few chairs and other people can certainly move in if you'd like to squeeze onto the end let people settle in um, um, hi everyone uh, I'm incredibly honored to be asked by Adam to comment on his uh, incredible book uh, which uh, like all of his other previous publications displays his best qualities. Uh, an attentiveness to empirical detail married to a theoretical sophistication that is worn lightly, lucidly, clearly. A generosity towards uh, what and whom he reads and incorporates that prevents him from strawmanning arguments and putting forward uh, a, a very strong and well-supported argument without polemics. Uh, and an encyclopedic knowledge of not only his immediate area of interest, but a much more expansive historical and geographic milieu. In this, I remember a conversation we once had over probably too much wine about what he liked to read, and we, we uh, bonded over the fact that he was a great fan of Peter Brown. Peter Brown, for people who don't know, is a late antiquities historian who does nothing with the golf today. Uh, but it was, but, but it says something about um, Adam's incredible erudition uh, and his expansive knowledge that he uh, reads these extraordinary texts in which, in, in, which uh, allow him to frame uh, his arguments in a much longer, or situate his argument in a much longer history. In some ways, this book is a uh, culmination or a continuation of his two previous books. His first book specifically dealt with the emergence of capital accumulation and class formation and state formation in the Gulf itself. And his second book, The Lineages of Revolt, is about the uh, prehistory, if you will, of the 2001 uh, 11 Arab uprisings. And by bringing these two things together in this book, he does us a great service because now he actually allows us to focus uh, the way that uh, surplus oil wealth or petrodollars from the Gulf countries are recycled. Uh, now we know that they're often recycled into armament, uh, purchase of armament, Saudi Arabia, UAE, all of them are uh, some of the biggest purchasers of oil, but it, uh, sorry, purchases of our arms from European and US and other states. But in a way, what this book does is it shows us where else the, these petrodollars are recycled, which other sectors, and perhaps, uh, very importantly, um, which, the, which countries of the Middle East. I mean, we know about the football jerseys that uh, Barcelona and Paris Saint-Germain and Man United and Arsenal and all of these guys wear, which are, you know, carry the logos of various Gulf countries, but it is really important also to talk about where this money goes closer to home. 
some of the areas where this uh, money goes, this capital goes, uh, are of course traditional industrial sectors such as aluminium, steel, and cement, and downstream hydrocarbon production, which uh, Adam attends to. He also talks about agribusiness, retail, various other forms of infrastructure and utilities investments, uh, again, beyond the Gulf itself in uh, the, the broader Middle East. Now, uh, one of the things that was uh, I really enjoyed reading was where Adam was talking about the investment of golf capital in urban development, urban projects, and uh, essentially development, uh, city development or building uh, trade. Uh, what I can best describe this, and this is not what Adam would use, he's a supreme rationalist, this is my way of describing it, is the way that uh, capital investment in... Um, I'm sorry, I mean that in a positive way. Um, uh, the way that capital investment in real estate uh, in a great uh, deal of the Middle East actually functions uh, as a kind of magical thinking. Now, what I mean by magical thinking here is the kind of thing that Marx meant when he talked about money being a kind of a fetish object, in the sense that there is an element of magic about this, an element of self-reproduction, which does not necessarily lend itself to clear explanation, to clear rational or logical arguments, although a reproduction of capital itself is a fundamental element of that, and to emergence of capital out of capital in ways that don't quite make sense. So there's an element of surreality um, about this. Anybody who's here here from Beirut, and I see a few, uh, will know that there are all these buildings rising in Beirut, enormous multi-story uh, towers, most of which are completely empty. At night, the, the towers are completely dark, and yet they become repositories of Gulf capital. Uh, actually, we don't have to even go that far. If you look at the Shard, which was built with Qatari investment, we know that more than half the building is empty, not rented, not used. So there is an element, this is the element of fetish and magic that I'm talking about. This is not capital, reproducing capital in ways that are productive or noticeable or visible, but actually capital investing in these fixed objects that have a magical quality. Of course, this is not limited to the Gulf. That's exactly how Trump made his money. He's a terrible businessman, doesn't make any money, and yet by investing in buildings, he buys enough credibility to actually get credit from the banks and therefore perpetuate a kind of a magical thinking in the New York scene. Um, but this is also happening. And I think that some of what um, Adam writes about uh, in his incredibly lucid and very clearly detailed way about investment, uh, golf investment in uh, these buildings is quite um, uh, illuminating uh, and perhaps uh, draws the veil on some of that magic or draws, rips the veil on some of that magic. The second area, which uh, I'm glad um, Adam himself wanted to point to, is telecommunications. And part of the reason that I'm really interested in the question of telecommunications is because I see a continuity in the way that uh, golf money is going into internet and mobile infrastructure today with past infrastructures of communication that were transformative. Not in a technologically deterministic way, but as a fundamental element of capital accumulation in previous eras. My students in infrastructure Structure, my infrastructure course know that I'm kind of obsessive about underwater cables uh, and telephone cables and data centers and internet. And, and in part, this is not only because, of course, without these uh, uh, technologies, um, the, the, the forms and the extent and the intensity of capital accumulation wouldn't have been quite as it is today, but also because they are profoundly political projects. Um, Adam points to the fact that Morocco and Tunisia are connected to the uh, worldwide um, undersea cable through uh, infrastructures that are owned by Saudi, I believe you said, Gulf capital, by the UAE capital itself. But, um, but there are, of course, uh, those kinds of infrastructures also exist um, in Palestine, for example, where the mobile networks um, in, in uh, Palestine, in Lebanon and elsewhere, um, have at least investors that are coming from the Gulf, and therefore they have they hold an inordinate amount of control over those infrastructures. Now, this is not only the power to cut off 
um, the internet or mobile telecommunication at a time when you need it. We know Egypt did that in 2011. It is also the power to listen in. And anybody who has read the work of uh, artist, uh, geographer Trevor Paglin, uh, or seen it on television, knows that in fact it's the solidness, the concreteness, the reality of these infrastructures. Not, not that it's a mobile set of radio frequencies, but that they're actually cables underwater makes them very vulnerable to being tapped, to being listened to. And if you own the cables, then you don't even need to tap them. You have access to that data. So this is a fundamental form of surveillance capital that the Gulf is accumulating in ways that echo, but also surpass past forms of telecommunication accumulation. Finally, um, both because you and Sarah mentioned your chapter on financialization, I won't go into it too much, but I wanted to draw out two minor points that, again, were of uh, interest to me. One of the things that you point out in your chapter on financialization is the importance of public-private partnerships. And in some ways, I think that... Um, the fact, that the, the fact that the Gulf has used public-private partnerships as a modality uh, or promoted them as a modality of investment in lots of places also points to the ways in which it's sometimes not quite easy to distinguish between the state and private business in the ways that we do. That the, the boundaries between them are blurry and something like a public-private partnership actually shows those blurry boundaries in really fascinating sorts of ways. Um, now, that was one of the things that I was interested in. The second thing that I was interested in, of course, was you mentioned the, um, the exponential growth in management consulting and other kinds of managerial services uh, that come along with financial financialization. Now, um, for all my sins, I'm a repentant management consultant. Uh, I, I was, before I became an academic, I worked as a management consultant, not for McKinsey, so <laughs> at least, um, or the other one that, um, that uh, worked for Pentagon. Uh, no, I, 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 w I didn't do anything so evil. Um, but uh, what is interesting is, of course, that the rise of these management consulting firms is interesting not only because of the reports they produce. McKenzie, for example, um, wrote the 2030 vision, the vision 2030 for Saudi Arabia. There were rumors that they actually cut and pasted from some other place, and there was like Lithuania left in the cut and paste, paste document, which should tell you exactly how much those management consulting services we used to offer to companies at really exorbitant prices are actually worth. Um, Lithuania and Saudi, you know, very similar economies. Um, but uh, but what, was, what is also, of course, I'm being facetious here, what these management consultings do and have done historically is um, have been at the sort of the leading edge of uh, implementing uh, of uh, expanding, of uh, bringing forward uh, capitalist ideology and practice, of, be of, of being instruments for the globalization and diffusion of a set of managerial practices that end up forcing people into obeying certain sets of standards, rules, uh, and regulations that often still, despite the, the globalization of capital in all sorts of places, still a lot of these rules and standards emanate from the North Atlantic. And I think that this also has to be taken into account because the vast majority of the, man the consulting firms that provide the advice to the financial firms are still primarily uh, and fundamentally, although they have offices everywhere, they are ultimately headquartered in the North Atlantic. So I think that that also was of great interest to me and the way that you incorporated them as part of the process of financialization, I think also shows something about the comprehensiveness of your critical vision of the area. Now, um, how, uh, how much do I have? Maybe a minute. Okay. I have like 15 questions. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask you... Uh, Two. <laughs> um, the first question is uh, for us academic nerds. So uh, Sarah commented at the end of her talk that she was, or maybe it was at the beginning, that she was very happy that to read a book that didn't center oil. Um, but as somebody who's just written a book uh, about transport, uh, uh, transport taking place in the, in the uh, um, Arabian Peninsula, how do we provincialize oil? Because ultimately, 
the fundamental beginning of the processes of capital accumulation, uh, expansion, etc., uh, or perhaps not the beginning, but the fundamental acceleration of that process happens with uh, the discovery, exploitation, and export of oil. Uh, in the 19, uh, well, 1930s, but especially from the 1950s onwards. But also, how do the transformations uh, that are happening now, and I'm not just talking about regular fluctuations in the price of oil, uh, how do the transformations that are happening now in the structure of global oil production going to affect this? What I'm talking about is the fact that in the last couple of years, the US has surpassed Saudi Arabia and Russia as the largest producer of oil in the world. Uh, it has done so because of fracking. It's still not the world's biggest exporter because it consumes most of its own oil. But the very fact that the US is now producing a huge amount of its, the oil that it needs, um, I'm curious about whether this affects the processes of production of oil that produce the kind of surplus value that goes into these investment funds and uh, capital investments, uh, part particularly of the sovereign uh, wealth funds, perhaps not so much of the capitalist. And so I'm curious about that. And the second question that I have is, you begin your book with the story of Mohammed bin Salman flying to Japan to set up SoftBank as a kind of a mega venture capital firm of a sort. Um, but interestingly, what has been happening is I'm, I'm really interested in SoftBank because of all the really dodgy investments they're making in all sorts of technology in the US. Uh, again, because I was just a weird techie. Um, but um, what I'm really, what I've been following the news, actually in the last two or three days, there have been a lot of really interesting news coming out about the SoftBank. One of them has been that, um, that uh, uh, the rating agencies are actually rating SoftBank really poorly and saying that its investments are pretty bad. And then, uh, and then there's also a news item came out in Wall Street Journal last night that the PIF, the Saudi um, uh, Sovereign Fund, and the Wadala um, are not happy at all about the prices SoftBank has been paying for some of these uh, venture, for, for some of these tech firms that it has been buying. So that was really interesting to me because in some ways um, that says that there is a kind of a limit that emerges out of both political and economic circumstances to the power of these massive sovereign wealth funds with their enormous reserves of dollars that they can go in and plonk down and transform places. And I was wondering if you could possibly talk a little bit about those limits. Thank you very much.